Welcome. Good Friday. My name is Paul Woodburn, and I serve at, as the pastor at Tilsonburg Alliance Church here in Tilsonburg. And on behalf of myself and Brent Shepherd, who serves as pastor at Bethel Pentecostal, Mark Barrett, who serves as pastor at North Broadway Baptist, and Steve Ameren, who serves as pastor at First Baptist Tilsonburg, we want to say welcome to what we hope is the first of many Tilsonburg Community Good Friday services. Today, what we want to do is we want to invite you to reflect on four stops or stations on Jesus's journey to the cross. So in a few moments, Brent Shepherd is going to come and he's going to share with us, invite us to reflect on Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. It's going to be followed by Mark Barrett, who will share with us about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then Steve will come and invite us to reflect on Jesus in the courts. And then I'll get an opportunity to return and invite you to reflect on Jesus on the cross. As I was thinking about how to uh, start this time together, which scripture would be good, it occurred to me that perhaps the best scripture to start with would be what is perhaps the most famous, most popular scripture around the world from the Bible, John 3.16. And I wonder if you would, if you don't mind, say that scripture together with me as we begin our time together. Our translations might be a little bit different, but that's okay. Let's all recite it together. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him need not perish, but can experience life to the full. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you did not send your son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world, so that we can experience life to the full. Amen.
This grace that you've shown for us, this love that you've shown for us, on the cross where you died for us, God will make a way where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see oh, He will make a way for me oh, He will be my guide Draw me closer to His side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way make a Good morning. It's a privilege to be able to take part in sharing a Good Friday message with you today. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that we were talking about this as pastors and wanting to bring our congregations together, to be in one place, in one room. And now, here I am, recording this by myself. And I just can't get out of my mind how quickly life has changed. How it just the reality that I once knew just seems to be slipping through my fingers like sand, no matter how hard I try to hold on to it. It just feels like nothing's going to be the same after this. I, I feel as though the way I think and what I believe is about to be tested in a way that I'm not sure I can handle or even want to deal with right now. Well, in Luke 22, verses 7 through 38, I believe we can get a glimpse into a similar experience. You know, I believe that there were things that Jesus was wanting to teach in those moments that we can understand. I believe that the disciples were experiencing similar experiences. I believe that that was what it was like in that room that day. It was a simple room and a traditional meal, but a meal that was meant for much more. A meal that was meant to bring a group together was the last meal before the circumstances they were about to face would tear them apart. A meal that Jesus would use to teach them about his suffering, but yet he would still need to suffer before they truly understood what they're being taught. This was a familiar meal, and I kind of feel like this was like a storm for them. See, They'd been out on the water many times before, and, and it was a familiar thing that they, they've experienced. They've been to this meal. They've had the Passover meal before, but there was something different about this one. It, it, the pressure was different. It was like a storm was brewing. There were difficult things that were beginning to be said. Jesus was going to talk about how he would suffer. Jesus was talking about how he wasn't going to be with them anymore. He was talking about how someone would betray him, how, how there was 
this moment, these moments that were too tense and it was too much. And, and they were starting to crack under the pressure. The disciples couldn't see their way through all this. They started arguing about things that didn't even matter. But Jesus understood what the disciples couldn't see. That his journey to the cross would set people free. Jesus asked them to use this meal to remember him. He did it so that they would understand something bigger and something greater. It's what he's been pointing to his whole ministry. And what they were trying, he was trying to tell them in that room was that his journey to the cross would be very difficult. It would be filled with difficult moments, but it was all for a greater purpose. Jesus was trying to give them something. Jesus is trying to give us all that same thing. It was trying to give us all hope. Jesus knew we would need him as we face the future. That we would need him to look to as our only true hope. In this last meal they had together, Jesus described things that we would face in life. Jesus dealt with things that we would face in life. Pain and suffering, betrayal, overwhelming emotional pressure, being with people you care about, but then having to leave them, say goodbye. If you're feeling these kinds of things and you're feeling these kinds of tensions, I want you to remember something that we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. It says this, let me read it for you. Do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We don't look to Jesus as someone who doesn't understand what we're going through. In Hebrews 4, 15, we have this encouragement. For we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet did not sin. When we're facing difficult times and we do not have hope, the times that we face can become more difficult and more dark. If we're seeking to understand what will bring us hope, we have to start by looking to trust in Jesus. It's when Jesus is our hope, it becomes possible to find healing in the midst of brokenness. It's when Jesus is our hope that it becomes possible to experience forgiveness after betrayal. It's when Jesus is our hope, it becomes possible to begin to see the light of truth in our darkest hour. Life and faith can be like that room, like that storm of emotions. Sometimes we can't take the pressure. We don't understand or we're even confused. Tempted to just think about ourselves and save ourselves. Jesus had a very clear mission. I think it serves us well to remember what it was. In Luke 19.10, he simply says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. We can forget that there are other people in a storm. When we remember Jesus, we can't ignore what he went through and he did everything to serve us, to save us. There are people in a storm that we can help. Now is the time, and these are the days, to renew our passion, to be focused on what Jesus was focused on. So, let's keep ourselves focused on what he was doing all of this for, to help people that don't understand who he is, or what he has done. We need to remember the journey that Jesus made to the cross, and use it as a way to refocus ourselves on his mission. Jesus' journey to the cross has set us all free 
He's given us a way to find true hope and freedom. The only hope that truly frees us is the hope we find in the person of Jesus. God bless you today. The Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turned my the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed The portion of scripture that we're going to be looking at this morning is found in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 26. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn there with me. You know, we can all identify with emotions of joy and excitement, can we not? Uh, so when, you, when, when a new baby enters into your house, you have, have your first little brand new little baby. Isn't that an awesome moment? Uh, the joy, the excitement that fills your heart and the emotions and your love for that little baby... Or, or what about when uh, a bride and groom are standing at the altar and they say, I do, and they become husband and wife and join together as one, and you can just kind of sense the, the excitement and the joy in the room, can you not? Or, or maybe you can identify with joy and excitement uh, thinking back when maybe you bought your first house or you got into your first apartment and uh, just you'd been saving and you'd been putting, saving up the down payment and, and all the, uh, now you're in the house, right? You've moved in, you're in your apartment, you've moved in and there's just this, I don't know, this joy, this satisfaction that comes over you when that happens. And we can all identify with those times of joy, but you know, when you read about the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, you don't get any sense of that joy or excitement when you read about the story of Jesus. But instead you find sorrow and you find distress and, and there's grief involved in it. Let me just set the context for you. Jesus has been in the upper room. We've just talked about that. 
And he has done some teaching, and uh, he had prayed with the disciples, and they leave the upper room, and uh, they, they go down through the, the, the valley and up the other side to the Garden of Gethsemane, this place where they are accustomed to. They had been there before, maybe many times before. It seemed like it was a place of prayer for them. It was a place where they had gone often to pray, to be with the Father together. And as they enter into the garden, he leaves eight of his disciples on kind of the outer edges of the garden, and he takes Peter, James, and John with him to the inner parts of the garden and he says to them you wait here you wait here stay here in fact Matthew chapter 26 verse 38 says he said stay here and watch with me and he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed but the garden quickly you know became a place of slumber did it not because after Jesus had gone away to pray he came back to the disciples where they were and Verse 40 says that he found them sleeping. I, I guess that we could go so far as to say that the garden also became a place of betrayal. Betrayal. Because not only did the disciples go to sleep, but it was also the place where one of his disciples would betray him and turn him into the authorities to be arrested. It was also the place, you remember, that after he was arrested, all of the disciples fled and ran from him, the very ones who, who had pledged themselves to him and said that they would never leave him, they would never betray him, and yet they all ran. But it also came a place of accomplishment. It's a place for where the Father's will was fulfilled it was what jesus you know was born to do it was what he had spent his entire life preparing for it was the father's plan before the very foundations of the earth were created that jesus would be here at this place at this time headed to the cross of calvary and you and i will never ever be able to fully comprehend what christ went through in the garden we can't we if we, we if we were with jesus we could never say oh jesus i i identify with you <laughs> no no we could never identify with what jesus went through in the garden the scripture says that in the garden jesus was in agony which which is a reference to the severe mental struggle and emotions luke says that he sweat Great drops like blood. Now, we don't know whether it was literally blood or, or what Luke was describing there, but imagine the anguish, the droplets like blood. I kind of think that it was blood because of the agony that he was in. And Matthew tells us that he was exceedingly sorrowful to the point of death, and that's talking about the degree of his grief. Oh, the pain. And the agony that Jesus was experiencing when he was in the garden. Christ went through something that is totally unique and that will never be experienced by anyone else, including us. You see, this was a gateway to eternal life for us. And I want to make it clear that Jesus was not agonizing over his eventual death on the cross. That is not what he was agonizing over because Jesus himself stated the reason that he came to this earth in the first place was to go, the, go to the cross. He was prepared for the cross. No, what I think was concerning him in the garden was that he might not be able to go through this trial as a son of man, as a son of man. Oh, he knew that he could go through it as a son of God. There was no issue about that. There was no question about that. Satan couldn't touch him there. But you see, Satan's assault on the Lord would come through, would come through for us on his way uh, as solely as the Son of Man. His, his, his primary goal was to get Jesus to go through this trial as a Son of Man. You see, you, you, remember, you remember when Satan came to Jesus in, in the wilderness and he tempted Jesus? When Jesus was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and, and, and Jesus overcame that temptation, did he not? He was tempting him as the Son of Man. And the Bible says that the devil departed from him until an opportune time. And now, in Gethsemane, Satan returns to him. 
This is the opportunity. He thinks it's the opportune time for him to finally uh, assault him and get him to to go through this as a son of man in the garden. And it's the agony of Gethsemane where Jesus is fulfilling uh, his destiny as the savior of the world and where that veil is is pulled back to show us what it cost him to make it possible for us to become sons of God. In fact, his agony is the basis for the simplicity of our salvation. For you see, if Jesus had have gone through this trial as a son of man, he could have never been our Savior. And Jesus wanted to make sure that he was going through as a son of God. You see, the agony of Christ and eventually what led to the cross gave all of us a way to access the very presence of God. What was once broken in one garden, the Garden of Eden, Jesus accomplished in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. For it was in that garden that Jesus accomplished his Father's will, and where the seed of the woman stepped on the head of the ancient serpent, and from where Jesus would head off to die, that we Gentiles might be called Abraham's descendants forever by putting our trust in in the work of Jesus Christ at, at Calvary's cross. Hallelujah. What a Savior. When I survey
as you and I journey through life, we often find ourselves in a place that is very difficult and challenging. And maybe you know the feeling of injustice. You know what it's like to bear the pain of accusation and you wonder in those moments, will anyone defend me? Does anyone know what I'm going through? At one time or another, you will have a, an experience like this. I wonder on the journey of life if you've ever experienced the pain of injustice, the sting of slander, or being falsely accused of something you did not do. On the journey of life, you and I may find ourselves in these situations, and we ask ourselves, does anyone know what I'm going through? Is anyone there to defend me? Well, as you and I journey with Jesus on his way to the cross, we find him in a place where he stands trial before the courts of this world. Some of the greatest powers of his day asked him many questions, and we're going to find today what happened as Jesus stood trial in their courts. And so we go to Luke's gospel in chapter 23 and starting at verse 1, and read along with me. It says this, And the whole company of the Jewish leaders arose and brought Jesus before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. And we read on in Luke chapter 23 and verse 11, And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this day they had been at enmity with one another. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. We read on in verse 23, the outcome of this court. It says, But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. You know, that day, Jesus stood trial before three of the greatest authorities of the day. The first authority was the religious authority, the Sanhedrin. They were the religious rulers over the people. And these so-called priests, these priests failed to recognize that standing right before them was the one true high priest, Jesus. The second authority that Jesus stood trial before was Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. He was a so-called king of the Jewish people, and this false king failed to recognize Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the true king of the people. The third authority that Jesus stood before was none other than Pontius Pilate, a governor who represented the Roman authority in the land. He represented Caesar and the whole of the Roman Empire. And this governor of this so-called empire failed to recognize that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords stood right there before him. These three so-called authorities were concerned more than anything about their power and their position. And they saw Jesus as a rival who threatened their grasp of power over the people. But the irony here is that their power was exposed as mere weakness as they stumbled over one another in what to do with Jesus. Now get this, over the course of eight hours that day, eight hours, there was a total of six different trials, six times where Jesus stood to give an answer. And the accusations that they hurled at him exposed their ignorance. Their lack of legal process 
exposed their corruption. They were willing to break their own laws and regulations to accuse, convict, and condemn Jesus. And by the end of those eight hours, the most innocent man in history was sentenced to death. This was the greatest mockery of justice that the world has ever seen, and these leaders were blind to who stood before them. We get a clue as to what was going on here when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. It says this, Yet among the mature we do impart a wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood us this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I wonder, do you have wisdom to recognize who Jesus is? Do you understand the mystery of what Jesus has come to do? It says here that the leaders failed to understand these things about Jesus and recognize him. And we know that in their flawed decision-making and their sinfulness, Jesus was led away to be beaten, mocked, reviled, and scourged to carry his own cross on the way of suffering. And he willingly did this for you and for me. He was willing to take the injustices of this world, the greatest injustice this world could ever deal out, so that you and I could be justified before God. Jesus was accused and abandoned. He took the place of guilt, of punishment, and of pain for us, so that you and I could be set free. On Jesus' journey to the cross, Jesus endured these trials out of love for you and for me. John, in the 19th chapter of his Gospel, verse 30, describes for us that moment when Jesus, suspended between heaven and earth, pinned to a Roman cross, heaves in what must have been an excruciating breath and says, Tetelestai which is translated in your Bible and mine as it is finished. Then his head dropped, chin to chest, and he gave up his spirit. There is no way that, that we can imagine the pain, the anguish, the sorrow, the despair, the shame that the followers of Jesus would have experienced at that moment. See, they had believed, they had gone all in. They had not just hoped, they had believed that Jesus was the one, the one who would push back Rome and reestablish King David's throne and kingdom. And now, it's finished. They had gone all in. The, the fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, John, on the day of the greatest catch of their entire lives. Nets breaking, boats sinking. You can imagine them having heaved this net onto the shore, only to have Jesus come and say, follow me. And without hesitation, they had turned to their friends, their family, their loved ones, and left it all and followed Jesus. Even, even the mama of James and John had come to Jesus on her knees, begging him, Lord, grant me this request that when you come into your kingdom, my boys would sit one on the left and one on the right when you sit on your throne. Matthew, the tax collector, not the most honorable occupation for a young Jewish man, but a lucrative one, sitting at his tax collector's table when Jesus had come and said, Matthew, follow me. And without hesitation, he had gotten up and followed Jesus, leaving it all behind. Philip, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, Thomas, all of them. On one occasion, Peter, in a conversation with Jesus on what it means to be committed, had said, Jesus, we gave up everything to follow you. 
We gave up everything. They had believed. Oh, there were others who followed Jesus as well. The, the crowd in the thousands, especially when he performed miracles, opened blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, lips that had never spoken were now singing praise, limbs that had never walked were now healthy and functioning. He healed the leper. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He raised the dead. People were beginning to openly whisper, could this, could this be John the Baptist raised to life again? Others said, no, no. Remember Elijah taken up in a chariot of fire? This is Elijah returned. Others said, no, Jeremiah. But they all acknowledged that when he spoke, the very power of God was contained in his words. At one point, they wanted to take Jesus and make him a king by force. Jesus would pull his disciples aside and, and ask them, I, I know what the crowd is saying, but, but what do you say about me? And Peter, no doubt, with a great deal of confidence, had answered, you are the Christ of God. Even when the crowds had abandoned Jesus, and Jesus turns to the twelve and says, and you, will you leave off from following me as well? They had answered, where else can we go? You alone have the words of life, and we do believe and are convinced that you are the Messiah. We believe and are convinced. We believe and know it. You are the Christ of God. And now, now it's finished. No one had to ask what Jesus had just said. The thieves heard it. The soldiers at the foot of the cross heard it. The, the friends and followers heard it. The religious establishment who stood at a distance mocking. Everyone heard it. Everyone heard what he said. But no one understood. I wonder if you've, if you've ever seen those um, YouTube videos where a kid will take a bottle of Coke and drop a Mentos into it. And the reaction causes a, a fountain to erupt from the mouth of the bottle. Have you seen those? What do you think would happen if we could take light in one hand and darkness in the other and throw them together in a bottle or a container or throw them into a room and shut the door? Which would win out? Light or darkness? It's not a trick question, really. We've all been in a darkened room or in a closet and flicked the switch and seen the light come on. It happens every morning when the sun rise. Put light and darkness next to each other and light will annihilate the darkness every time. This is the eternal dilemma of a holy God who is pure light and life and holy who loves us desperately. For, for him, a God like that, to draw near to the likes of you and me, well, it would annihilate us. See, the gap that exists between us and God, this, this chasm that has opened, this barrier that has erected, is not to protect God. It's to protect you and me. So what to do? We can't remedy the problem, but God. <laughs> God came up with this brilliant plan. He would take his divinity and wrap it in humanity. And he would come as one of us, fully God, fully man, Jesus the Christ. He would live among us, allow us to pin him to a Roman cross. And there he would die to open up a channel, a way by which we could be restored in relationship to God. See, when Jesus, when Jesus said, it is finished, he wasn't saying, I, I'm, I'm beat, I'm exhausted, I, I, can't, I can't go on, I can't do this anymore. He didn't say, I am finished, he said, it is finished. He was referring to the mission, the plan, 
plan to open up this access by which you and I could be invited into relationship with God. See, when Jesus said it is finished, he was saying that the barrier that existed between us and God was destroyed, that that gap had been bridged. You and I are being invited into relationship with a holy God. This is why we call it Good Friday. I wonder if you would be willing to do something with me. On the count of three, would you be willing to say, it is finished, on the count of three, all together. Let everybody in the house hear it if they're not watching this with you. Would you do that with me on the count of three? Here we go. One, two, three. It is finished. You and I are being invited into relationship with the holy God who loves us.